Hi, Toolboxers, and welcome to episode 289 of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox podcast. Today, we're going to have a great talk, as we do every month, with Kevin Gregg talking about updates when it comes to U.S. immigration and federal courts and BI stuff. Always a lot of fun talking with them. It's always a very popular episode, so I'm looking forward to that to help you improve your practice and your life as an immigration lawyer and so on in the field. Um, before starting, I want to remind everybody the new magazine is out, the new issue number seven. Check it out at iltbox.com or immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com. You can find that there. We're working on updating, and it's a lot of work, the marriage green course I have, course I have for people who are interested in getting involved in immigration and getting into this field, or they recently graduated and want to learn about immigration law. It's becoming more of a thorough course, adding layers and layers to it, um, which means it takes a lot more time to do, but excited to have that out soon. So be on the lookout for that and stay in touch about that course. I do want to thank our wonderful sponsor, DocuWise, who's been supporting us for so long, DocuWise.com, the all-in-one form system that supports immigration practitioners, not only in completion of forms, but also uh, having a handy toolbox there of all these different tools to be able to manage your your your, your law firm, including time tracking, you know, payments, connection to translation company within the system, and a lot more. Check it out. Go to DocuWise.com and request a, a sample, a practice thing, or, or go talk with someone there, a salesperson, so you get to know the software better before you pull the trigger. Uh, but I think it's something you can enjoy and use for a while. Um, everything discussed right now is going to be generally for general education only, not intended for individual legal guidance. So having said that, if you have a question or comment or something like that, email me at info at immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com. And if you have a chance, please just go and support the program by liking and subscribing and putting a five-star review wherever you see this, or write something even better, but at least just put a five-star on, on, on uh, Spotify and iTunes, wherever you're listening to this, the work you get out about the program. Having said that, thanks so much and look forward to seeing you uh, in the podcast in a second. Hey, Kevin, how are you doing, man? What's up, John? Happy mid-June. Thank you so much. Uh, any any plans to leave us the city and the state or you got any travel plans or you, you're in San Diego for now? Are you going to go to ALA next, next week? That's right. I always. ALA National and then actually some some vacation going to Hawaii for my sister-in-law's wedding. So uh, busy Busy couple of weeks trying to wrap it all up now, so I'm in a decent spot for for the travel that commences. Nice. So now my internet's being a little whack, so sorry if it cuts in. And I hope the report doesn't get that bad. But you used to definitely keep yourself busy with work and fun and all that kind of stuff. It's a good life, but at the same time, you're, you're, <laughs> no no second unused. It seems. I don't know if I keep myself busy or if uh, circumstances do. How about yourself? You're you're going to Orlando. Yeah, go to Orlando. I'm going to go like on Thursday evening. I'll get there. So I'm going to miss the first day or two, uh, first day and a half, essentially. Uh, but I'm looking forward to I never stay up for the Saturday party. So I'm going to stay there for that Saturday party. This oh, time cool. around. I, th I think you're leaving for then, right? Or Yeah, I got to leave. So I don't get to go to the party. I got to go to the, the sister-in-law's wedding. Yeah. I mean, she, she wouldn't move it for Ayla National. So I'm kind of stuck <laughs> in the line there. <laughs> well, that's all right. I'm have a good time in Hawaii. How, how many days are you going to be there? Like a week and a half. It's going to be a good time. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, it's like a whole, that's a real vacation. <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to clean myself off after being in Ron DeSantis's state, even though that's where I was born and that's where I'm from. I don't don't love the the opportunity to, to return to what he has turned Florida into, but, you know, hope springs eternal. Yeah, I wonder what's going to happen with all the farm worker situation, because I saw, I mean, what's going on with food prices, because all the food's going to be left out there, uh, practically speaking, that's a... Yeah, there's so much. I mean, I I mean, I thought we were past the days where we would target countries for for arbitrary things, but to hold that to 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 pass a law that says Chinese people who aren't LPRs or citizens can't own property in Florida. That I mean, that sounds like well, something that happened. I was thinking about. I didn't. I I think about like the the workers where they have to leave the job because they work. They passed the Chinese uh, property ownership law. Yeah, there's a lot in these order. You, you can't. If you're from five countries, you can't own property except with some exceptions within like military or sensitive areas, which also, to be honest with you, is just seems like ridiculousness. But then they specifically target China without any military connection, any of that saying flat out, if you're not an LPR or a U.S. citizen and you're not domiciled in America... And what kind of non-immigrant would be domiciled in America, except maybe an L? I mean, who even knows? You can't own you can't own property in Florida. Like, what what is that? 
Yeah. <laughs> what, Texas, what is that? Something like that too. If, we, if, you, if we run or something like that, you can't own property in Texas. Could, are these even constant? I don't know what the rules are, but it seems like uh, a constitutional kind of thing. I think ACLU sued. It's just sad that that we're 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 back to this. Where I mean, this one point what four billion Chinese people? We're just gonna oh. paint them all with a broad brush. That's insane. It, it, it's it's not it's not how I viewed this country. But you know, that's the time we're living in. Yeah. So we're gonna go party there next week. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> We're going to go party there next week. <laughs> so what's going on the case front side? Again, always. So we're a bit late for the May cases. Um, and who knows when I'm going to get this video out. So people are going to be like, wait, what are they talking about? It's like, there I, you go. I hope I get out before Alien National. <laughs> we're talking about the May cases and always just the good ones. There were quite a few good ones in May. It started off with like eight non-citizen adverse, but then there were some interesting ones. So I'll, I'll go through them quite, you know, try to be quick. Um. Matter of Morales Morales, which came out during the FBA conference where there were BIA members at it, which was amusing to me. <laughs> um, you know, Matter of Morales Morales, Mr. Morales Morales didn't uh, didn't win, but it but it created a good, decent, a life preserver for for the non-citizen bar. And that is that no longer is the 30 day appeal deadline for BIA appeals jurisdictional. It's now a claims processing rule. Because everything's a claims processing rule now, what that and all? that means <laughs> okay. <laughs> what what it means is that it can be equitably told, which means if you okay. miss your thirty day filing deadline to get in your notice of appeal to the BIA, you have hope. Now it's still rough. You still got to establish equitable tolling. You still have to establish due diligence, even if you're one day late. And it looks like based on this Morales Morales decision that they're going to start talking about equitable tolling, whether you exercise due diligence from day one, not from, you know, day 25. In this case, for example, Mr. Morales Morales hired his attorneys like just before the filing deadline. And so the due diligence clock started not when the attorneys were hired, but from the IJ's decision because the focus is on the non-citizen. So it's still difficult to establish equitable tolling. But it used to be the case that if you were even one day late, you had nothing. You just had to beg the BIA to certify it to itself. Now you have an argument. Now you have the ability for the BIA to exercise equitable tolling and accept your late filed notice of appeal so long as you can establish that there was due diligence and that some extraordinary circumstance got in your way. Now, Morales Morales, they didn't use overnight shipping by mistake like they usually do. And I, I guess some assistant or the attorney used regular mail just by oh, accident. Sure. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it's terrible, right? Um, but and even that is not extraordinary, which I mean, come on. Like, yeah, it's pretty I, bad. I can understand the due diligence holding by the board. Fine. I'll accept it. Like the clock starts on day zero, not on day 25. I'll, I'll, I'll accept that. But like, Come on, attorney made a mistake. His staff made a mistake. It's an exceptional circumstance, I would think, but not to the board of Morales Morales. Either way, equitable tolling still applies. And yep. there's still hope, not recommending to miss your appeal deadline, still use Ben Winograd or any of the other same day services to file your appeals timely, but it's always good to have a, a standard, something to argue. Morales, Morales. You mentioned the BIA uh, during the Trump administration. There was a court packing scheme there for the BIA. Did that happen, or is there any changes in the make of the BIA that you're aware of with the new administration? The BIA is packed. The BIA was it the Trump administration both expanded the BIA and added new appellate judges, too, okay. and then pushed out individuals who had been there during the Obama years, and then replaced them. So they did both of those things since. Under Biden, one BIA member has been replaced with Judge Sines, and the BIA member who was replaced became the, uh, I think, the chief immigration judge. And that's that's the only reason there was even an opening. So when it comes to the BIA and the appointment of BIA members, I mean, one 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 political party is clearly playing a different game yeah. than the other political party. I mean, you can just look at the statistics with the with the appellate immigration judges that were appointed under Trump. They all had certain uh, denial rates for asylum. It, it does seem that that was one through line that could help explain what kind of judge was going to be 
appointed to the Board of Immigration Appeals under Trump. And there were there were many of them because, again, the number of BIA members was expanded yeah. under the Trump administration. Um, on this, completely unrelated, but have you ever seen the movie The Marta... I think it, I, more, more, I can never say the country. Mauritania, the, the country off the coast of Africa. Sure, he's got um, a yeah, case approved of Mauritania. That's first Mauritanian client, yeah. The movie The Mauritanian with um, Jodie Foster. Have you ever seen it? It came no. out a year or two ago. No. Benedict Cumberbatch plays a Guantanamo Bay prosecutor who comes across, not to give it away, but sympathetic in the movie. Mm-hmm. And that is Judge Stuart Couch from the Board of Immigration Appeals. <laughs> <laughs> Benedict Cumberbatch is playing a sitting BIA member. Before he was a BIA member, apparently he was a Guantanamo Bay prosecutor. I don't, I mean, I don't know the real story, but in the movie, and I, I guess, I guess it's based in part on the real story. So a BIA member gets to be played by Benedict Cumberbatch. It's I, if I was a BIA member, I'd be bragging about that literally every day. <laughs> so yeah, you don't even know it's Stuart Couch in the movie, but like there's one, it's like they call him Stuart, and then there's like one scene where they say like Stuart Couch, and my wife and I, we look at each other like what? <laughs> Can't be. And then it is. Look it up. <laughs> Your wife those names too. Is your wife practice law? Yeah, yeah, my wife, my wife is a career uh, law clerk for a federal judge in San Diego. But before that, she was actually an immigration herself. She was an attorney advisor in immigration court, uh, like me, but just later. Oh, to know the names of the BI, yeah, to, to, that's to, true. To yeah, that'll go way above my. That's <laughs> true, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's true. That's that's a high level of nerd. <laughs> high level, <laughs> couple high level of field professionals. Uh, but really cool stuff. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> um, so. Whatever else Stuart Couch was, and he was certainly part of the Trump BIA packing. He also apparently was at one time a Guantanamo Bay prosecutor who, if the movie is any indication, did the right thing. But, you know, movies, who knows? It's Hollywood, C O C. So the movie would have you believe it. I mean, we are talking about accused. Uh, 9-11 terrorists as well. The whole thing is complicated. But yeah, um, so <laughs> matter of Morales, Morales. Um, after that is Tercios Flores v. Garland out of the Sixth Circuit. This one is just great for quotes. It, it's it's an asylum case from Honduras. Um, really just all of the good things that you like to hit in particular social group cases, nexus cases, the difference between nexus for asylum and withholding of removal the sixth circuit is one of those circuits with a lesser nexus standard that for withholding than with asylum not going to get into all of that um but it's just, it's a must read in the sixth or with any of these cases and so many asylum cases are like this one of the countries in you know one of the triangle countries in central america miss tercios flores and her husband owned land ms-13 is a, get, making them get a war tax threatening to kill them because of it. Um, you know, all of that stuff. The husband flees to the U.S. and then they turn to Miss Tercios Flores um, and her and her children. And, you know, without getting into all of that and the nexus and the complicated, and it's a very favorable case, highly recommend it. But what is maybe best for the case are quotes like this. Well, before I get to the quote, for a particular social group to be cognizable under asylum law, it has to be immutable, um, particular, and socially distinct. And so, you know, those are hard in and of themselves. Then if you even establish that it's a legitimate particular social group, you got to show that there's a nexus to the harm, that that was one central reason or a reason for the harm suffered or feared. So preliminarily, just getting over the particular social group is it immutable is it a is it a fundamental and here's the quote honduran land ownership is a fundamental characteristic something that hondurans shouldn't have to change to avoid being persecuted that makes it immutable honduran land ownership is immutable in the sixth circuit that's a big deal mm-hmm. and also it goes against the matter of eral from the bia in 2020 with guatemalan land ownership so like it's a big deal yeah, um, they're denying these for years, so 20 years, I mean, denying these, right? 
Yeah, I mean, and well, you know, it depends on the IJ. The stuff always it's it's so and, you know, there's always new cases and it's so hard to say what is the law, but that's a great quote. And you still need to establish particularity and distinctiveness for under and land ownership, but you're over immutability. That's something to always remember in the Sixth Circuit and others. There were multiple particular social groups in this case. Another one asserted was single mothers living without male protection. That's a pretty common one. Um that we see in these type of cases. And here the Sixth Circuit said, quote, single mothers living without male protection is socially distinct. That's the third element for a particular social group. So if you can show that that's immutable, and quite frankly, I don't see how that's not immutable. I mean, you're a single mother living without male protection. You shouldn't, it's probably immutable. Is it particular? That might be a hard one. Who knows? But uh, the, the Fourth Circuit has great particularity case law not to get into here. But social distinctions are often one of the harder one, the hardest element to prove. And here is the Sixth Circuit saying social mothers living without male protection is socially distinct. The reasons are because Honduras distinguishes them. There is a broader category, vulnerable to persecution, the deputy commander of the Honduran National Police explains that gangs identify vulnerable people, such as women with children, to target. And, you know, that's creative lawyering yeah. and probably present in all of these gang type cases. I mean, like, of course, right? Like, of course, the police in these countries are going to say that single women with children are more susceptible to being targeted by gangs. And wherever that is shown, that can be a factor used to show that the group is socially distinct. So big case for stuff like that, big quotes, you know, a lot more things to go, but you know, the case is remanded and a lot of other good stuff from that decision for people to look in your asylum cases. That's interesting, they're opening it up and in some circuits they're opening up asylum, some they're closing, it's just like this, I don't know if amorphous is the right word, but just like, um, it's this live thing where like one door is open, one door is closed. It's, it's crazy how the circuits are working out on the asylum issue. Very much so. I mean, even this decision itself, I mean, it's a split decision. Judge Chad Riedler essentially dissented. He was uh, appointed by Donald Trump. He was actually head of the civil division uh, under Trump for a bit, which made him in charge of oil. Um, you know, he reads it, comes a completely different conclusions so like not even you can't you can't even paint circuits with a broad brush i mean sometimes it's the panels in either direction saw quite a few split decisions over the last month and a half so i mean judges have different opinions on this stuff well, look at the six um it's like four states essentially and you compare the ninth which is like this humongous area uh um, oh, nine is huge six i mean it's ohio there but uh the rest michigan i mean there's not that much population in those areas too it's interesting i don't hate on michigan michigan's a fine state michigan's fine got a state, population a lot of people left i think california's leaving everyone's leaving here too but <laughs> but it still seems small like compared to the rest but hey you know take it <laughs> no no offense to the six circuit uh tennessee kentucky ohio <laughs> <right here. laughs> yeah. so that is tercios flores great case must read uh, was doing a lot of posting about it on the so on social media with those quotes because they're really helpful. People should know about it. Mm -hmm. And like you know, six circuit stuff isn't binding anywhere except the six, but like it's persuasive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something to rely on if you don't have anything from your circuit, of course. As a former law clerk, attorney, advisor, it is kind of when you start when you get a brief. Just for everyone listening, when you get a brief and it's filled with out of circuit citations and especially for things that are like common like you know you get a if you got a brief for the san diego immigration court explaining the three requirements for a particular social group relying on fourth circuit precedent like you can find a million ninth circuit cases for the three elements like it just it sets off a brief on the wrong tone and makes you look not serious just a heads up for brief writing like you always yeah. cite the in, in circuit precedent unless you can't unless yeah. you're trying to push the circuit law in a certain direction like the tercios flores decision would do mm -hmm. i know why people do it it's because they have their brief and they don't want to rewrite it they don't want to do more research and westlaw is expensive i get it but like <laughs> you know I mean, the, the judges 
you're, you're, all, we, all we can do is speak through our writing. So like, you well, know. speaking of Westlaw, is your database open yet? I know you're collecting databases. So how could someone access it to find to find these resources? Yeah, they've been on the Curseband website almost since day one. All of these cases are on the podcast website uh, with a bullet about what they're about. Um, and I, I make that bullet helpful for me because I go do all the time. So you can do control yeah. find on that page. And and if you typed in, if you forgot it was Sergio Flores, you typed in Honduran landowner or landowner, you'd find it quick. That's how I'm doing that. It's a free Westlaw. There you go. <laughs> Well, I don't have the case there. Hopefully, one day you still got to find the case. But you can find that the you can find the case. All I I read these cases day of free from the circuit websites. So like, I mean, this is all free. It's just harder to get. Text and Justia. Yeah, they have all the cases. It's just put yeah. the name. Okay. You just have to know what to look for. Yeah. Good stuff. What's number three that we have today? Number three, Ruiz v. U.S. Attorney General out of the 11th Circuit. Because like, if the 11th is going to do something non-citizen friendly, I got to talk about it. Um, also, congratulations to recent 11th Circuit appointee Judge Abudu, um, comes from Southern Poverty Law Center and before that ACLU. So, um, it's quite the appointment in the 11th Circuit. Um, although a bit frustrating as well that Judge Martin gave, uh, made that seat vacant, not by taking senior status, but by retiring, which means that, uh, you know, Progressive judges only get one replacement on the 11th rather than two, as all of the Trump replacements did during the Trump years. They all took senior status and then got replaced below. But Judge Abudu will be fantastic on the 11th. Anyway, she's not on this decision. This is about what is the definition of extreme cruelty for the Violence Against Women Act. Mm -hmm. And that is something that there is a dearth of case law on. You know, everybody assumes that you got to be beaten physically and it's got to be this terrible thing. And that's not the case. VAWA is for, um, you know, domestic violence or extreme cruelty. And cru what is extreme cruelty? Well, it's not domestic violence, right? <laughs> it's not. It, it's something else. And here, the 11th Circuit was very clear and expansive about what it is. And before I define it, you know, just what happens to Miss Ruiz, essentially, she marries, um, I think he's a U.S. citizen or an LPR. I can't remember. He's got to be one of them. I think he's a U.S. citizen. And she gets breast cancer. And then he turns into a complete prick and, like, you know, says if she has to get a mastectomy, like, she's no longer a woman and, like, you know, forces her to look at herself in the mirror and then like divorces her when she gets a mastectomy to save her life is just terrible. And the 11th Circuit is very clear, then like took $2,500 from their joint bank account, just like treating her horribly. She oh, that Bible case not approved. That's not, that, that one's a good one. That that Bible case wasn't approved, approved by USCIS in the first place. Well, it's immigration court, immigration judge, oh, yeah. the BIA deny it. And they all are essentially saying, well, you know, you weren't physically harmed. So that's not VAWA. That's not, I guess it was, I think it's, it's VAWA, it was VAWA um, cancellation of removal, okay. which is very favorable. You know, it only requires three years rather than the 10 years continuous physical presence and service of an NTA doesn't stop the accrual of the years. And there's, there's all this other stuff, but like either way, she didn't suffer physical harm. We all agree. Although well, she was grabbed by the arm, but she clearly suffered psychological abuse. I and mean, you don't have to be, it's not hard to understand that that is traumatizing stuff. Yeah. And it was all corroborated. It's not like nobody believed that this happened to her. And so here's the 11th Circuit overturning the IJ and the BIA on this saying, no, physical harm is not interpreted like uh, required for the VAWA and extreme cruelty means something else. And here's the quote. Um, you know, it, it includes both physical and mental abuse. And it quote, it's a term of art in the family law context. So like, take all of and I've done this before, take all of the family law state court decisions about what is extreme cruelty when there's like, you know, divorce or disputes over who's going to have child custody, bring that in to explain what extreme cruelty is. Mental suffering qualifies, quote, acts or omissions of such character as to destroy peace of mind or impair bodily or mental health 
or that destroy the objects of matrimony, end quote. Mm -hmm. That's that means that means whatever you want it to mean that but that I have that extreme cruelty, right? I mean, a spouse who is destroying the marriage through cruelty. That's that that seems to qualify. This Ruiz case opens the door in the 11th Circuit to say what really I think what should have always been the law, but there just isn't so much citation that you don't need physical harm. You just need an LPR US citizen spouse being an asshole. Yeah. In an extreme manner. Interesting. Uh, you, you would have thought that, yeah, that would have been a given, but you got some case law for it now that can be used uh, more and more around. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. The VAWA is the, the point of VAWA, I think everyone would agree, is so U.S. Uh, so non citizens don't have to stay in marriages that are abusive just because they're scared of their immigration status. And so what, what, why would there be a distinction between physical harm and terrible mental suffering? I mean, I've had adjustment cases where the spouse comes to me, they tell me they're abusive. I'm like, huh? Like, and uh, really, I simplify one cases a lot. And they just stick in that relationship. It's why I hate the I simplify one so much with conditions because it causes so many people to be in terrible relationships because they're worried about losing status, even though it has the vow S kind of uh, waivers for it. Uh, yeah, you can, you, can file, you can file a unilateral 751. Yeah, but and then they, you got to meet that standard. Yeah. Yeah. And they're afraid. They don't want, and the good yeah. thing, if, you, if you're approved on that, you can file for students show three years soon instead of the five years. But uh, they just don't want to risk it. So I, it's just that this whole system. Um, I mean, the abuse stuff is, is ridiculous, but I'm glad they're fine tuning it. Yeah, well, I mean, at least it's there, right? Like, mm -hmm. that's not at least the, the congressional recognition. And here are the circuits and the agency finally coming around. Like, extreme cruelty is in the statute. That's got to mean something. Yeah. It clearly doesn't require physical abuse, or else they would have just stopped it at the first phrase. Yeah. Well, good stuff, man. Any uh, other cases? Or that uh, we get the three. Uh, I can do. I can do. You know, I can do a lot. I mean, Ishmael, the Attorney General of the U.S. out of the third. I'm not. I'm not going to get into it so much. It's just a head spinner. You can't visa waiver, and you can't terminate asylum after they have a refugee status, even if they came visa waiver. It's a whole thing. I'm not going to get into it. But read that if you want an intellectual challenge, and you ever have a visa waiver termination of asylum case. Which who has that case anyway? So. Uh, there you have it. Yeah. Uh, is it the one where they had a passport for a country visa waiver, but they were from that country? Yes. But then he gets asylum and then he commits, <laughs> he gets convicted of aggravated felony. <laughs> and so, and he wants to adjust. And so, you know, if he, if he applies to adjust, an aggravated felony doesn't bar adjustment. It only bars adjustment, right? Maybe as discretion, but then there's a favorable refugee adjustment provision and it only matches the definition of an inadmissibility offense. And ag fell is not an inadmissibility offense. But what ICE did is they moved to reopen his asylum only proceedings where he got asylum because he was only an asylee. He hadn't adjusted yet. And then you're in asylum only proceedings. He can't apply for adjustment. And of course, an aggravated felony bars asylum grant. So, I mean, that's a it's, a, it's a cute procedural move by ICE before the IJ. The <laughs> IJ bought it. The BIA said it was okay. The Third Circuit said, no way. No way. You, you can't do that. You, once he became an asylee, you can't treat him as if he is a visa waiver overstay. Like, he, yeah, he's, he's, I mean, already, that's kind of ridiculous. he's already become an asylee, but it's a... The lack of certainty <laughs> in, in whatever you have is, is kind of out of control. Like, that's a fun case. Yeah. Well, um, Kevin, thank you so much. Uh, are you speaking to any panels uh, in, in Vegas, in, not Vegas, in uh, Orlando? Yeah, Crimmigration on Friday afternoon. Um, and I'll also be going to all of the immigrants list uh, events, Ira mm -hmm. Kurzban's political action committee with Sui Chung, who's also getting an award. And of course, the entire great board of immigrants list will be going to those presentations as well as they give their awards and I mean, they really are the the entity fighting for immigration reform on the Hill. So, like, they're good. I'll be going to that. But, yeah, speaking on crimmigration, uh, leading the discussion on crimmigration on Friday, actually, better panelists than me. I'm just the discussion leader. 
Well, you're going to do a great time. Um, it's going to be fun. I, I wish it was a Friday afternoon because it's like, it's, 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 the only thing worse than that is Saturday afternoon where my thing is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, Friday, I'll, I'll take Friday afternoon. That's fine. It's not late Friday afternoon. It's like, no, it's midday. Like, I'll okay, take right noon. Noon is fine. Yeah. So I know where to find you then. Uh, everybody, Friday, noon, uh, Orlando, Kevin's going to be there. Be bring there. your own bring your own criminal that's the price of admission to the panel <laughs> sounds good bro good seeing you again catch you next month see ya bye have you ever felt that the road to establishing a successful immigration law firm is riddled with unexpected obstacles and setbacks i've been there and i'm here to tell you you are not alone picture this my wife then girlfriend and i had just landed for a vacation only to be greeted by a voicemail that changed everything in an instant, once the plane landed, she lost her job. The very one job that was supposed to support us while I launched my own solo immigration law firm. Suddenly our financial cushion vanished and I was thrust into the high stakes world of entrepreneurship with no safety net. Despite a slow start and a discouraging lack of leads and referrals, I remained determined to build a law firm that provided a five star client experience. After countless hours spent researching, watching, and implementing marketing strategies with mixed results, I eventually began to see my firm revenues not only surpass my previous revenue and salary as an associate, but double it. Today, I run a successful law firm with a team of associates and support staff, and I'm the proud founder of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox magazine, podcast, courses, workshops, and more. But my journey wasn't easy. I made many mistakes, wasted time and money, and wished I had a mentor to guide me through the challenges. Although I was fortunate enough to find a few peers who offered support, I couldn't shake the feeling that there had to be a better way. That's why I decided to be the change I'd wish I'd seen. This month, I'm thrilled to announce a launch of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox Private Mentorship and Peer Group. This exclusive group is designed to bring solo and small firm practitioners in a monthly, private, and intimate setting to hopefully discuss business strategies, share successes, even exchange invaluable tactics that they would have shared anywhere else. By joining this premium group, you'll not only benefit from my hard-earned expertise, but also forging long-lasting relationships with like-minded professionals who are committed to elevating their practices. Space is limited for this game-changing opportunity. If you're ready to make a real, lasting impact on your business, simply email me at info at immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com. Again, that's info at immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com and I'll send you all the information you need to get started. Don't miss this chance to transform your immigration law firm and reach new heights of success.